Hello everyone and welcome back to a new video in modeling analysis and design of piled foundations. Now in this video of course we are going to continue our topic and discussions with regard to theoretical principles in pile foundation. This is a precursor for the application of those things in robot because when you apply in robot there are geotechnical aspects that you cannot do in robot so it must be explained here so that we have a full understanding of how to model them and how to check those piles. So in this video, we are going to talk about Vesic's method in estimating the tip resistance of piles. Now, of course, if you stumbled upon this video, then please notice that this video is part of a bigger video series where we're linking on the top right. Take a look on that before you continue this if you are new to this series. With that being said, sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Alright, now to understand Vesic's method, Vesic's method is based on something called the theory of expansion of cavities. Now you can check this out and basically what it tells you is that if you have a cavity or something inside soil and you are pushing on that something inside the soil, then there are two regions that develop around the pile. One of them is called the plastic zone and one of them is called the elastic zone. I mean, this here is the pile. So whatever is near the pile is going to be affected the most and whatever is a little bit far away of the pile will, will be affected less. Now keep this in mind because the book Project M does just tells you here are the equations and I'm trying here not only to give you the equations but I'm trying to give you the rationale behind Vesic's method. Now Vesic in his research on the expansion of cavities noticed that there is a region that affects the resistance of the tip the most which is what he calls a plastic region and this region is affected by multiple things it's affected by the average stress of the soil and it is affected by the lateral stress of the soil. In his theory, he basically tells you that the tip bearing capacity is going to be the area of the tip multiplied by the ultimate bearing capacity of the soil, which he explains to be sigma and sigma. Now we have seen this before and sigma is some sort of factor that can be taken from tables and this factor, if you're wondering, all of those magic factors, I like to call them, are not really magic factors. Those are factors taken for a, from a gajillion of tests and from correlation relationships. So it's not just a magic value. This is value based on tests. What about sigma? Now, the book just throws in this equation, but I don't like that. This is basically average stress. When you have a bar above something, this basically denotes an average. But average of what? It's the average of the stresses that affect the bearing capacity. It's the vertical stress from the soil and the sideways stress from the soil from the left and the sideways stress from the soil to the right. So we know that a lateral stress is going to be a factor multiplied by the vertical stress. This is, for example, the at rest lateral coefficient. We can, of course, use this from Rankine's theory. Here I'm invoking your knowledge of soil mechanics in this case. You can see that he's basically saying one third multiplied by the direct pressure, the vertical pressure, multiplied by the lateral pressure from the left and lateral pressure from the right. This is basically what leads to the school equation. It looks scary, but it isn't, it's just the average. Now, of course, K0 here is the lateral soil pressure coefficient, which is one minus sine, uh, the friction angle. Please notice that this is based on, I think it was called Grand Keen's theory. And this is what tells you what sigma is. We need to know what N sigma is. And then sigma is kind of more interesting. To find n sigma, you are ultimately going to go to a table where you would have to input the friction and input the something called IRR. I will talk about this in a moment. And from it, you get the coefficient. And how do you know this? Based on a ton of tests and a ton of investigations from the Transportation Research Board by Vesic. Now, what is IRR? IRR is something called the Reduced Rigidity Index. So, there is something called a rigidity index and there is something called a reduced rigidity index. The reduced rigidity index is going to be a fraction of the rigidity index and it depends on the rigidity index and the volumetric strain because the more volumetric strain you have, the less rigid the soil becomes and that's why it's called the reduced rigidity index. Now what is the rigidity index? Here once again, Raja M. Das's book just throws at you an equation like this. It tells you here is IR. Now, I don't like those strange equations that just pop out of nowhere, so I want to explain those things. The IR, or the rigidity index, 
is basically basically the shear modulus divided by the shear strength. I kind of understand it differently here. Look, if you remember Hooke's law from mechanics of materials, you know that a shear deformation multiplied by the shear modulus usually gives you tau, the shear stress. That's what I know. In other words, following Hooke's law, gamma or the shear strain is usually tau, the shear stress, divided by gs. Now, this is the shear strain. If you inverse the shear strain, you get the shear rigidity. So if you inverse the shear strain, you would get something called the shear rigidity, which is basically gs or the shear modulus divided by the shear stress. I understand the rigidity index to be the inverse of the shear strain at maximum shear stress. So basically, it's the inverse of the shear strain at failure. If you are at the failure shear, then you would get gamma failure. And gamma failure is tau ultimate divided by gs, which means ir is gs over tau ultimate, and that's what you see here. So ir in this case, for me, basically means the inverse of the shear st strain at ultimate. You can see that this equation just transforms like this, but why? You see, we are talking about sand here, and the shear strength in soil, based on the more Coulomb failure envelope, is C sigma tan theta, or tan phi. I think I said this before, but sometimes I say theta instead of phi. That's an error on my side. If you have sand, then the cohesion becomes zero, and the shear strength becomes sigma tan, which also translates into Q tan, but that's how you got the equation. Of course, if you have a clay, it becomes different. And if you have a mixed soil between sand and clay, then you would have to take the full, full equation here. But alas, we are still in sand domain. Following the mechanics of materials, we know that GS, or the shear modulus, equals the elastic modulus over 2 multiplied by 1 plus the Poisson's ratio. This is a well-known theory in elasticity that connects the elastic modulus with the shear modulus with Poisson's ratio. This is exactly what happens here by replacing gs with 1 plus mu s. This replaces this. Of course, I can hear you asking, why even bother? We bother to do this because in soil mechanics, as you will see very soon, in Braja M. Das's book, it seems that the estimation of es and the estimation of mu s is easier than the estimation of gs. And that's why he flips gs into es over 2 plus etc. How can I find IR? Well, I need ES, I need mu S, I need Q, and I need phi. Typically, IR is between 75 and 150 for sand and 50, 75 for silt. Now, how can I find ES, the elastic modulus of a soil? It's really not that straightforward because there is a gajillion ways of finding the elastic modulus of soil. One of them is to take a pressure plate and put a pressure plate on the soil and basically apply some forces and then plot the stress strain diagram and from it find the elastic modulus. That's one way. Another way is to correlate the SPT, the standard penetration test number, with the elastic modulus. In the book Praja and Das, he tells that the elastic modulus is the atmospheric pressure multiplied by a factor of M, where M has some ranges for loose soil, for dense soil, medium dense soil, and for dense soil. Now, this is one way of finding elastic modulus of soil. If you have other ways, there is a gajillion ways. That's the strange thing in soil sciences, in geotechnical sciences in general. Like if you are a structures guy like me, you are used to having clear cut equations and clear cut cause and effects. Here, it's kind of foggy a little bit. And the reason behind this is because soil is a complicated material. It's a three phase material, and we don't know exactly how things are in the soil. There is a high deviation in the data we get from soil. There are some other equations that are needed because for the reduced index, you need delta, the volumetric strain, and you also need mu s. Mu s is basically given by Braja M. Das. It assumes a linear relationship between mu s and the friction angle, starting at, I don't know, like 0.1 or something, going all the way until 0.5. 4, 5, between 25 and 45. So it basically goes somewhat between 0.15 and 0.45 or something. This is an equation in Braja and Das based once again on a gajillion of plots where those dots are plotted between phi and mu, and then a line has been drawn, which is this equation. Fantastic. And that, of course, is here the volumetric strain. Now, all of this will lead to you finding something called IR, which is the rigidity index. 
and then IRR, which is the reduced rigidity index based on delta. If you have a clay, then this entire thing becomes zero and you can just go with IRR equals IR. Anyway, we continue and there are other equations for IR. Baldi, for example, uh, in page 561 talks about different uh, possible equations to find IR. Take a look on page 561 in Braja M. Das's book, Principles of Foundation Engineering, 7th edition. Now going on with this, once you have IRR and phi, you can just go into the uh, table and get your n sigma, which means that you can solve and find QP. Fantastic. So this is Vesic's method, and it also is applied in clay. So let's talk about Vesic's method in clay. In clay, the tip bearing capacity is going to be the area multiplied by, of course, once again, the bearing capacity of soil for a clay. And in the clay, it doesn't become sigma and sigma. It becomes C and C. So once again, our biggest topic here is to find and see. See you here is the undrained cohesion. Now, once again, from Vesic himself, he basically tells us that NC is this cool equation. So once again, we are stuck with finding IRR. But how can I find IRR? Well, IRR in this case is equal to IR. Why? Because delta is zero, assumed to be zero in clay. And if delta is assumed to be zero, then if you go back to the equation to check, you can see that if delta becomes zero, IRR is IR over one. Now, to be honest, delta is not zero. It's a very small value, and that's why there should be an approximate here instead of an equals. Now, if you have theta equals zero, then IR equals this. IR, if you remember, is called the rigidity index. It's the inverse of the shear strain which is basically the shear modulus divided by the shear strength, which is GS divided by this stuff. Now this is for sand, and let me just add here a C plus this stuff because we are talking about clay, and you can actually remove this entire thing. So in other words, IR in clay is GS, which is the shear modulus, divided by C, the cohesion, or CU in this case. But now there is something strange happening here because it just tells you here is the equation. Now how did we start from here, shear modulus over C and get to here. Well, let me explain this to you. Now we agree that the shear modulus is gonna be replaced by the elastic modulus over two multiplied by one plus mu s. That's from mechanics of materials. We should also agree that from the more Coulomb failure envelope, the shear strength of soil is Cu plus sigma tan phi. Now in imperfect clay, this becomes zero and the only survivor is Cu. So the equation should look something like this, Es divided by two, multiplied by one plus mu as Cu. But that's not what you see here. What you see here actually has a meaning because what happens here is that mu was assumed to be the maximum value of half. And this is a conservative assumption, by the way. So if you assume a maximum mu of half, you would get two multiplied by one plus half, which is three, which is what makes this equation make sense. You see, I kind of like when I study and teach mechanics of materials or even foundation, I like to keep the amount of memorization minimum by kind of making sense of equations whenever I can. Not all equations have a analytical way of understanding them, but whenever I detect an equation that can be analytically understood, I will immediately teach you this in an analytical fashion. Anyway, if you continue, you have IRR, which means you can find the NC for the clay. Why? Because you want to say CUNC. Now, if you want to continue, O'Neill and Ries suggested the following approximation for IR, and it's a different one here. It divides C U over P A, and by magic trick, you get IR. Why do you need IR? Because you want to find N C. Remember that. And of course, here another value is uh, this equation. I think that this equation is what is denoted here by O'Neill and Ries. This is a screenshot from the from the book, so keep a, take a look on that if you want, it's 11.35. Anyway, if you want to continue, this is a example that we want to talk about. Of course, here, this is Vesic. This is the same example of Meyerhoff, but this time we are applying it on Vesic. We want to calculate the tip resistance based on Vesic theory, given the following information, which are the same, by the way. It's fully embedded in sand. It's 35 degrees, gamma is 17, length of pile is 50, and the cross section is a rectangle. You want to find the ultimate bearing capacity QP. Remember that the full bearing capacity of a pile is the tip bearing capacity plus something called the skin bearing capacity, which we still haven't talked about, but we will talk about it very soon. We are now interested in the tip bearing capacity, so let's take a look on that. Now here, I'm trying to give you step by step 
Because once again, I want you to have steps to solve examples for this. QP equals AP multiplied by Q small p, which is this stuff. Now to be able to find this stuff, let me give you a quick roadmap. AP is the area that's easy to be found. Sigma is the average stress. And for, for finding sigma, you need K, which will give you the sigma. For N sigma, it's a long story. Because you need IRR, the reduced in the rigidity index, which needs delta and needs IR. And IR itself needs a ton of things. It needs the, it was what? It was the sheerest. It needs ES and it needs mu S and all kinds of funny stuff. So let's take a look how we can apply this quick roadmap on our equations. First of all, we calculate AP. Since it's a square, it's 0.45 times 4.5, no shenanigans whatsoever. To find K0, we need phi, and with phi equals 35, we get K0 equals one minus sine, which is this thing. Then we need Q dash because you need it in different ways. You need it for the sigma and you need it for, I think, ES. No, you need it for the IR, yes. Now here, this is the effective stress, which is gamma by LB. The embedment length, which is 70 by 50, which is this number. Now you can calculate the average stress, which is the vertical stress plus the two lateral stresses divided by three. And you can take Q dash as a common factor, which gives you this equation. So you have the value here. Once again, I want to remind you that ES can be found by a plethora of possible options. You could apply a plate test and plot the stress strain diagram and from it find the elastic modulus. You could use SPT tests. You could use some crazy setup to find ES, cone penetration tests, something. But in this case, we're not using anything of that. We're basically saying that ES is a factor multiplied by the atmospheric pressure, and the factor here depends on the type of sand. So that's the ES. Then we calculate the Poisson's ratio from the equation linear using 35 as our friction angle, which gives you 0.25. No, we, need, we still also need to calculate delta. And finally, we can calculate IR and then calculate IRR. It did change because the value gets multiplied by IR itself. From the table, finally, using IRR and using phi, I think phi was 35, let's take a look. So this is the 40 IRR, and that's the 35 friction angle. So it's like 53 point something. But of course, 53.67 is for IRR 40. So if you do some interpolation channel again, you land at 55. Using this, you get the tip bearing capacity. And that's it. Fantastic. That's everything I wanted to talk about today. I hope you enjoyed. And in the end, before I finish, I want to give a huge visage sized shout out to my dear channel members in the contributor level and the helper level whose names are going to be shown on the screen. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart as the support of the channel is priceless to me and enables me to provide you with videos hopefully on time and with a certain quality I try to achieve and for that I am forever thankful. In the end, I hope that you enjoyed the video and you found it beneficial. If you have enjoyed the video, then please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting, and so on, especially subscribing because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel, and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.